Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to tonight's screening of MAVO, Life of an Iron Man. Uh, my name is Peter Kilroy, and I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the Medzi Centre for Australian Studies and the Department of Film Studies here at King's College London. And we are delighted to be hosting this event in association with the Royal Anthropological Institute. So a big thank you to all of those organisations and to the staff at the Arts and Humanities Research Institute here at King's. Uh, a big thank you also to the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, who gave us permission to screen tonight's film, and also the other organisations who have helped to promote this event, including the British Museum, the Origins Festival, the Pacific Island Society of UK and Ireland, and the New Australia and New Zealand Festival of Literature and Arts. If ever there was a time for Indigenous Australia in London, this is it. So today is National Sorry Day, the anniversary of the Stolen Generations report. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that fact and acknowledging the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander custodians of Australia. One week from Mabo Day, I'd also like to uh, honour the memory of Eddie Mabo, his family and his Piadaram uh, Maryam ancestors. I should also stress that tonight's screening contains images, sounds and names of Indigenous Australians who are now deceased. If you'd like to know more about the wider British Academy project, um, including upcoming screenings and events, please check out screeningthetorrestrait.com over the coming months. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome our guest of honour this evening and director of the film, Dr. Trevor Graham, who's kindly managed to fit this event into his rather hectic schedule um, and agreed to participate in a Q&A after uh, we're finished the session. Trevor has been at the forefront of Australian documentary filmmaking for over 30 years. He is the co-founder of Yarrabang Films uh, and has been head of documentary uh, at the Australian Film, Television and Radio School in Sydney, as well as producing, editing and commissioning countless documentaries for ABC and SBS Independent. He has a vast back catalogue of films under his belt as writer, producer, director and editor, uh, including Painting the Town in 19, uh, 1987, Airplane Dance in 1994, and Make Hummus Not War in 2012. He also has a string of awards to go along with them. Tonight's film won Best Documentary Awards from the Australian Film Institute and the uh, Sydney Film Festival, as well as a New South Wales Premier's History Award uh, and the Literary Award for Best Screenplay. For those who are unfamiliar with it, the film focuses on one of Indigenous Australia's most famous land rights activists, Eddie Koiki Mabo, and the landmark High Court ruling of 1992 that bears his name. This ruling, in principle at least, deemed that an indigenous system of land ownership or native title preceded colonial rule. And this set a precedent which challenged the entire basis for the colonization of Australia. And we're still seeing the legacies of that ruling playing out today, not least in the push to, to recognize indigenous Australians uh, in the constitution. As Paul Kelly and Kev Carmody would suggest in their 1991 song, from little things, big things grow. So to say a few words to introduce the film, please give a warm welcome to Trevor Graham. Thank you, thank you. And thanks Pete for inviting me here to um, this special screening of Marvo. I briefly want to give you a little bit of context for the release of the film. The film was released in 1997 at the Sydney Film Festival and then went on to the Melbourne Film Festival. But the context for that release is quite important to the success of the film. In 1992, the High Court handed down the historic Marbo judgment. Marbo, I'm ashamed to say, was more or less a four-letter word in the media. Nobody really knew what Marbo was. Nobody knew that Eddie Marbo was a man, uh, that the Marbos were a family. It was simply the Marbo judgment. It became uh, a bit of a political football. 
Um, and then in 1993, Paul Keating's Labor government, in response to the 1992 Mabo judgment, introduced the Native Title Act, which was a mechanism for solving Native Title land rights claims and disputes. And it was an enormous advance step forward for Indigenous rights in Australia. We leap forward to 1996 and John Howard wins a landslide election and one of his platforms is to uh, cut back the Native Title Act of 1993 to make amendments to it. This became quite a cause celeb amongst the Indigenous community, rightly so, as you can imagine, and amongst supporters of Australia's Indigenous communities. So the film was released, it was made in 1995, over 1995, 1996, going back to also to 1989. It's been made over a period of seven years and then was released in 1997 in the, uh, the milieu, if you like, the political milieu of yet another fight over Indigenous rights in Australia. And that context for its release, I think, contributed to its reception. I won't say any more than that because there are events in the film that you will pick up on uh, that give you a hint of the sort of uh, the veracity of the sort of debate, if you could call it a debate, uh, from various sections of the Australian community. So I hope you enjoy the film and I'm really happy to talk to you afterwards about it. Thanks. Okay, so we have some time for questions and comments. Um, if anyone would like to kick us off. Uh, there's a roving mic that Sheridan Yes, there's a question here. Um, I oh, thank you for the film. Um, I'm asking out of just ignorance. In the beginning of the film, you said um, the warning to Aboriginal people that there is an image of mm -hmm. who passed away. Mm -hmm. Is there something that they are not supposed to see the image of passed away? or? This is a very complex question because across Australia there are different um, traditions and beliefs about um, images of deceased Indigenous people. It's not such an issue in the Torres Strait. Um, I did not want that uh, slogan to go on the head of the film because of that, personally. but. Out of respect for other traditions and beliefs, particularly in Central Australia, uh, I was prepared to go with it, and um, I still don't know whether I did the right thing by making that decision. Uh, but I, I literally had no choice as well because it is such a customary thing now for films about Indigenous people for that warning for that logo to go on. Um, but it's not something that is particularly relevant to the Torres Strait. So, and it's important to sort of acknowledge the, the differences and sometimes you just got to go with the flow. Sometimes a hard film to talk about afterwards. I've, I've had this experience, that, you know, this digesting going on dealing with the emotion of it all as well. Question up there? I have both a comment and question. Mm -hmm. uh, I did come across this case when we were dealing in India with regard to subsoil rights of people who were granted lands many years ago. And finally, in 2012, the Supreme Court of India did give them the rights for subsoil. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I had kind of read this, this case, more of a news uh, headlines. And I wondered uh, what is a two-hour uh, uh, film could be on such a small issue of giving a land right to somebody. And now I see the multi-dimensional aspect of a person 
and i think it really goes down to the root of human rights also mm -hmm. to how this goes. so that was my comment mm -hmm. the question now is um, whether in australia do you have now any codified law or this is judge made law is still going on and how much of litigation has that decision now raised do you have any idea on that well because uh, you uh, i'll just company because you also say there that one of the objections was that now even in urban australia there could be claims by the aboriginals saying that some of these lands probably belong to them so mm -hmm. that is where i'm going to that's a question as to why i mean sorry is there any cases that have come up or cropped up because of these this decision um, well there's been lots of follow up cases across australia there have been um, some pretty wild card claims on settled areas of Australia, uh, but they're very quickly dealt with and they don't go anywhere because of property law and native title is deemed not to exist once freehold title has come into existence on a particular bit of land. So if, if over a period of time land has been sold and settled by European people, then native title can no longer exist in that context. And the, the headlines that you saw in the film were pure fear mongering by the conservative forces in Australia, by pastoralists, by some farmers, and by, particularly by their organisations who jumped on a bandwagon of this is a threat to, as you saw someone say, it's a, a great threat to Australian society. Well, it wasn't that. That was just fear-mongering. Um, the, the Native Title Act came in in 1993 to uh, put forward a mechanism, a legal mechanism, whereby uh, courts could more quickly and easily deal with um, Native Title claims. and. Since then, I, I can't tell you how many uh, native title claims there are around Australia now, but there have been quite a few successful ones, and there's been ones that have not been successful as well. It's quite a rigorous process to prove native title. You've got to pr prove a continuous connection to the land and a, a, a continuous um, sort of yeah, relationship via your family going back you know, as many generations as you can. So it is quite complicated. Do you think that the uh, judgment was deliberately couched in a way that would enable land claims to be made by people who had formerly been hunter-gatherers? Because the Torres Strait Islanders were gardeners and there's no problem for me in seeing that people who were gardeners would have a notion of property. Mm -hmm. Whereas the argument has always been about hunter-gatherers that they have to make a much more difficult claim to land because there wasn't any notion of that kind of having tilled the land. Mm, yeah, the, the, the notion of sort of putting up fences and uh, tilling the soil is fundamental to the concept of terra nullius and why it was denied over such a long period of time. But I think in Australia, in since the Mabo case, there's been a much more sophisticated notion of the hunter-gatherer, the, the so-called nomad. And it's something that Aboriginal people themselves have challenged over time because it, it, it's not really that relevant because mo all the tribes or clans in Australia had very defined areas. Um, and the, the notion of going into someone else's territory like it is on Murray Island, is something that applies across Australia as well. Uh, and more sophisticated notions of um, agricultural use, uh, using the land, seasonal movement within a defined area of land, these things are becoming much more to the fore in that traditional notion of what is a hunter-gatherer and, and the so-called nomadic life to the point where I think it's pretty much discredited these days. The, 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 court, the, court, 
The court, if, if you read the judgment, and you know, I'm no expert on the judgment because it's legalese, but the, the, court, the High Court of Australia very much pitched the Mabo judgment to apply to the mainland as well. It, was, it, it opened up the, uh, the sort of the claim and the, the system of native title on Murray Island. It was couched in such a way that it could apply to the mainland, and it did, and it opened up all sorts of claims, which have been settled. And native title is not very controversial these days. It's just, you know, it came and it went as a controversy. Trevor, thank you very much. That was terrific, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess this question is coming out of the juxtaposition of watching this film on Surrey Day. For me, there was a great reminder of the whole Mabo controversy, in a sense, and in a sense, a recognition of how much um, that's been replaced in my mind, in a sense, with other preoccupations coming out of the stolen generations, coming yeah. out of um, yeah. all those other things. So I guess the question is, what was it like for you to be watching the film today, this evening, in, in the context of um, kind of contemporary controversies in Indigenous issues in Australia? Right, OK. Um, well, I, I don't know how much people are aware of what's going on in remote communities in Australia at the moment. And I can't remember exactly what Tony Abbott said, but it was something like people who live in remote communities are sort of exercising a, a lifestyle choice, which was considered to be, you know, a pretty big affront to the people of those communities who are living in their communities because that's where their, their law, their traditions, their customs, um, their family backgrounds reside, their spiritual beliefs reside. And to my way of thinking, Abbott's comments about it being a lifestyle choice were just sort of another another notion of terra nullius in a way that people have sort of gone there because, oh, it looks nice. Nice bit of land, nice bit of dirt to live on. Um, and it completely denies or shows a, a lack of understanding of the point of connection that people have to their traditional lands and what that means to them. So, you know, the... I guess, you know, the Mabo case sort of pushed Australian society in a certain direction and for the better, um, but, you know, you get these things coming up every now and again which just sort of push it back the other way and that's the great tussle, I think, in life, in society here uh, in Australia and it, it's sort of one step forward, two steps back or two steps forward, one step back, depending on who's in power. <laughs> There's another question here. Thank you. I really welcome the, to, the, uh, the opportunity to see the film, so that's good, great. Good. Um, is this really just a comment? Could you talk a bit about the, uh, the soundscapes you were making? Because I was very struck by the soundtrack, tr both the music and the way you had... Yeah. Okay. The, um, the, the, people, the, voice, the voice it, of the film. It's, it's a long time ago, but um, look, I think the film has three distinct phases that match the three distinct parts of Eddie Marbo's life, like the beginning of the film, which is largely archival based, telling his early life story. Then it moves into the Marbo case, which we, we started to film in 1989. And then the latter part of the film was all filmed in 1995 and they and it, I, I don't know whether you noticed but the the last 10 minutes the last 15 minutes of the film after the desecration of the grave it's it's a bit more sparse it it allows the emotion of the moment to come through there's very little um, you know interview or talking head um, you go down the track with the coffin through the dense jungle um, foliage and, and the shots are longer as well. So we wanted to give that sense of actually the coffin coming back to the island and the quietness and the stillness of it 
and then the tremendous singing that comes with the final uh, putting of the, the coffin in the final resting place. The music, uh, the soundscape, um, of course we wanted the music to be you know, a, a strong part of the film because it is very emotional music. The, the harmonies of the singing, the drum beat, um, it's all, I, I find it all very moving and I still do, I have to say. Um, I can't really answer your question much more than that, I have to say. You know, it was a combination of the music and, and making moments quiet where they needed to be quiet and allowing you simply to observe the movement and what was going on. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you for your film. Um, it's quite a personal sort of history of uh, Marburg. And um, what I was wondering was about his place in history. So it's quite a simple parallel to mention Martin Luther King, for example. But do you think Marburg would ever have the capacity to bring people together, um, the sort of popular consensus we have about other historic kind of emancipatory figures? Or do you think he will sort of continue to be a, um, an issue that, that makes people have quite diverse views? It's, I mean, it's quite, quite a recent history, but do you think it will ever be something that all Australians will agree about? Well, I, I think to answer your question, you're sort of, um, you're right in a way. Um, is Mabo, did it bring people together or is it divisive? I think it does both of those things, but I think your question is slightly missing out on a point, and that is about human rights and history. And for Australia to have not recognised Australia when Australia was settled in 1788 and until 1992 for colonial administrations, for successive Australian governments not to recognise prior Indigenous rights in the way that happened in Australia but also happened in New Zealand and Canada. But in New Zealand and Canada there were treaties and in America there were treaties. There was nothing like that in Australia. So no prior recognition of Indigenous rights. That's a human rights issue. It's not just a question of is this divisive or can it bring people together. It's both of those things, but it's also this other issue of human rights that had to be solved. And, you know, uh, uh, we just couldn't have gone on with that form of denial because that's what it was. Terra Nullius was a legal fiction that the, the legal system and governments perpetuated with a kind of blindness by the Australian public. So that's my view of it. It's a human rights issue. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Lots of questions around here. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for the movie. I have a question about, um, you were pointing out the three phases of the film, being um, before 89, then 89 when filming started, and, and uh, 95. I'd have a question in particular about the earlier stages, so between 89 and until um, the court case, or until, until 92 when he passed away, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, the, um, and the decision, the court decision was made. Um, what were the early drivers of the film? Why were you doing it and what were you going to talk about when you started off in 1989? Was it going to be about the person or was the case that um, special already at the time or was it a bit of both? Okay, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, in 1988 I became aware of the Marbo case. I convinced the ABC in Australia and Channel 4 in Britain that there would be a really good film to be made about this and with support from the Australian Film Commission, we made a film called Land Belong Islanders. And that film, a 52 minute film, uh, concentrated on the court case itself. And it, set, it was centred around the court visiting Murray Island. It was finished in 1990 and hey, you know, the, the court case still was rolling on um, and we stupidly, as producers, didn't say to the broadcasters, we've got to wait till the end of the court case because they wanted 
you know, a place on the schedule for our film. So the film was sort of pitched as these are the issues, this is the history, this is the court case, um, and it had very little personal story in it at all, and it went to where. Then I continued to follow the case. I continued to do little bits and pieces of filming and photographing with the family. And then the Marbo case decision came out in 1992. Um, I sat on my bum for about three years and didn't do anything. Because uh, I thought, well, look, what am I going to do? You know, I've got a film which is made in 1989 about the court case, and I've got these other little bits and pieces. What am I going to do? And then Benetta said to me, why don't you come and film the tombstone opening? And I was able to convince uh, Film Australia, who were like a government um, documentary organisation, to back me to go and film the tombstone opening. And then lo and behold, the next day, this file desecration of the grave occurred. And that's when the penny dropped, so to speak, that I can actually put all this together and there is a very, not only a good record for posterity of Marbo, the case, the man, the family, the island, all of those things, all those strands coming together, but there was a very dramatic film and a very moving film to be made as well because there's such a, a well, you see the events unfold. Um, and you know, there's a very good record as, as the events unfolded. So it's at that point, Film Australia, together with myself, went back to the ABC and said, there's a feature film to be made here. And they backed it and the rest is history, so to speak. There's a couple more questions. Did you want to know? Oh, yes, it went back first. Yeah, yeah we'll come back to that. My next question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was terrific to see the work. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one may not be very helpful, but it's just on my mind, and it's to do with Men the Menzies Centre for Australian Studies. Um, I presume that's Robert Menzies, with, named after. I'm just thinking, I mean, we know his legacy is quite ambiguous, shall we say, but particularly in relation to Aboriginal, um, the attempt, broke, broken some kind of attempt for some kind of dialogue, um, in that context. I, I'm just thinking of the, the Maralinga case, the way that he oversaw the nuclear tests, not clearing uh, the people, blah, blah, blah. And they're, they're endless. And I just wonder whether a Centre for Australian Studies might reconsider his reputation and think about what might be, a fi who might be a figure um, who may be able to symbolise a more productive dialogue. I dare I even think the Marbo Centre for Australian Studies. <laughs> I'd be interested in your, your view on that. But forgive me for saying that if it's not helpful. Um, I, I'm going to be very, and then I've got I'm going to be very Go diplomatic on. about this and say that um, <laughs> that history is full of all sorts of contradictions, yeah. and I think it's great that uh, here I am screening a film for the Menzies Centre and the other organisations, RAI and the British Academy, uh, about an Indigenous land rights fighter like Eddie Mabo. I mean, that's just a contradiction of history. And yes, you're right about Maralinga, you're right about the, the sleepy Menzies years. Um, and a sort of a, an, an abstinence of anything to do with Indigenous issues really in terms of advancing human rights in those years. Um, but, you know, the, the kind of the pitch battles around Indigenous rights in Australia didn't really kick in until the 60s. There, there were prior precedents and I've been urging Peter to get a film called Lousy Little Sixpence, which looks at the Indigenous rights movement in Australia in the 1930s, a really important film made in 1981, I think, which has a great historical story to tell. But it, it wasn't really until the kind of, um, you know, po politics in Australia was enormously influenced by Martin Luther King. 
and, and the sort of the freedom rides that happened in America were, were mirrored in Australia with Charlie Perkins. So, you know, it's sort of like um, world history coalescing in the 60s with the Vietnam War as well and Indigenous people in Australia started to protest. Thank you. Another question in relation to the film, which is about um, the, the broader postdoc um, context of the research uh, around the nature of collaboration. Uh, and I'm just interested if either both of you could talk about whether you would describe this work that, that you've shown as a collaboration, and if so, how you describe that, how you define that even. And then more broadly, um, could you talk a little bit about the influences in the way that um, Aboriginal and Indigenous communities visualise their own history and whether editorially, aesthetically, uh, you see any differences of emphasis? Mm, that's, that's a really complex question. Um, what was the first part of it again, sorry? Just re remind me. Collaboration. Collab collaboration. The collaboration in the film uh, came from... Uh, well, it operated on a number of levels, initially going to seek Eddie Marbo and Bedena Marbo's involvement to make a film, to see whether they were interested, to see how we could actually work together. They both, but particularly Koiki, really sort of informed the content of the film, what we could do, what we couldn't do. But we also had to work with the lawyers. Um, we also had to get advice, legal advice about what we could do and what we couldn't do because the film was going to air before um, the court case was decided, although there weren't too many legal issues around that particular point. On the, the second film, the one that you've just seen, there was a lot of consultation with the family about particular stories, a lot of research, a lot of time spent together, um, a lot of discussion about what, what would have the key moments in the story and in a life. Uh, it included uh, a consultation at, when we had a, a rough cut together for several members of the family to come down, have a look, have rights of comment. Uh, there was actually one scene dropped because they were a bit not quite happy with it. Uh, and the rest of it was pretty smooth sailing and they really love the, the final result. I don't know that there are terribly much many differences between the way Indigenous people make stories for television than how I would in terms of the grammar of filmmaking, in terms of how they engage audiences, in terms of how they tell stories, in terms of how they impart information. But you've also got to remember that I and most of the people that I'm talking about have the ambition of a television broadcast or, you know, getting their stories out there. So there are sort of certain things that you need to conform to, I think, to tell stories for mass audiences. And I think most Indigenous filmmakers who, want, who have that aspiration do that. But having said that, you can go to lots of different community centres in Australia that have got media or Aboriginal or Islander media, media centres that have got um, different ways of approaching stories and storytelling, but they tend to be more for their own internal use rather than for mass consumption. Uh, if you go to Central Australia, there's the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, CARMA, and one of their jobs is to go out into communities and record stories and histories amongst the community, particularly from elders, for posterity, and they get made into films that can be very long and not necessarily for you know, mass public consumption and are more for internal use within those communities. So there's different functions and different types of stories and different ways of making films depending on who the audience is and the audience aspiration. I'll just add a little something, if I may, just about the broader context. Um, Torres Strait has a more or less 120-year history of film history. Um, I deliberately chose to focus on films from the late 80s up because of the shift towards collaboration. 
So films, this is part of the first stage of the project, looking at the films in the 90s that are largely collaborative, but not necessarily directed by Torres Strait filmmakers. In the 2000s, which is the later part of the project, there is a much more of a shift towards um, Torres Strait filmmaking. And as Trevor was saying, there is more of a focus on internal audience, but there is a huge proliferation of films made, directed, um, viewed and distributed by Torres Strait Islanders, um, but they're quite hard to get, and so there is a politics of distribution. So but this isn't focusing on these films exclusively, it's part of a wider, wider project. We have uh, another question in the front. Oh, um, yeah, I think we have a question. Thank you very much. I thought it was a wonderful film. Thank you. I just wanted to know how often it's shown in Australia. I mean, is it shown to schools? I think it should be shown yeah. as often as possible. Yeah. And, and uh. I would like to know how often it's shown. Well, I can't tell you how often it's shown, but I can tell you that it is on curriculum in, in schools and particularly universities. Um, it's in... Indigenous studies courses in universities, it's in legal studies in, in universities. Uh, 19, uh, 2012, rather, I went to a screening in Canberra at the National Film and Sound Archive. There were 300 people there with their Kleenex boxes, um, having a good weep. Uh, and that was for the 20th anniversary of the Mabo case. So it, it gets hauled out. Um, yeah, it, it's still in use, thankfully. So I think this is going to have to be the last question. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, a comment and a question. Thanks for a fascinating film. Um, uh, just my observation as a European was uh, how uh, shocking it was that uh, he wasn't allowed to go back to the island to see when one of his family was dying and yeah. how bad things were yeah. less than 50 years ago, which yeah. is remarkable. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, the, at the start, you talked about kind of the waters and fish. Was there a story about fishing rights as well? Because it then moved on to land. Um, and then the other question I had was, is there any kind of one change that you would wish for to kind of reconcile or reparations or any kind of legal change to get people living together more? In Australia, big question, but <laughs> so yeah. First, about the fish, and I, I, I'm and just going to say I can't answer the last one. It's too difficult. <laughs> going to pass the buck on that one. Okay. Um, but land and fish complicated. The the original 1982 claim started as a land and sea claim. Around about 1989, when I started filming, the the lawyers decided they were on a loser with the sea claim, it was too difficult. Uh, the Commonwealth leaned on them. I think I can say this now. The Commonwealth leaned on the lawyers to say, hey guys, we're funding the case and we're the ones that are responsible for the sea boundaries because the land up until the high water mark is a state issue. Okay, so the Commonwealth said to the lawyers, we're happy for you to pursue your case against Queensland and we'll fund you, but we're not so happy about you fighting a case against us for sea rights. So they had to make a decision about what was worth it. They also felt like they were having trouble in court actually proving their side of the argument in relationship to sea rights. So they strategised to say, we're going to drop the Commonwealth, the claim against the Commonwealth, we're going to pursue Queensland, and if we win that, will revisit sea rights. They convinced Eddie to do that, they convinced the islanders to do that, and lo and behold, what happened? They now have sea rights. So it was the correct strategy at the time, and yes, sea rights are now part of... the Torres Strait has a sea rights native title, um, and sea rights native title applies along the Northern Territory coast of Australia in certain sections as well. So that's opened the... Pandora's box for some, um, for other claims to happen. I'm afraid time has cut up with us, but we can.
continue questions uh, over wine and nibbles through that door, <laughs> the magic door over there. Um, but please join me in giving a very warm thank you to Trevor Graham.